I just want to welcome everyone to the last session of the day of uh, the SWP and the anti-racist struggle. Um, my name is Naima Oima. Yeah. Oh, you're gonna make me blush. It's okay. Um, <laughs> um, I'm from Southwark um, SWP. Um, so I guess everyone wants to talk about yesterday. And I think, I'm not going to talk about myself because I'm not vain, but um, I think it was very important considering UKIP's constant attack on minorities, especially Muslim women say that, um, that, must, that if they came in charge that uh, they would put a bad on Muslim women where the face fell. Um, and also said they will charge them or for doing so, just created a division between the election, which we were, we're going to see is going to be rifled with racism and attacks on whether it be migrants, refugees or Muslim women, and um, whether it be from Tories uh, or Trump or Le Pen. Um, I think yesterday the most touching bit was uh, when like activists or comrades from places I've never, like from uh, whether it be from France or Greece, like says put a message to me, say thank you for doing that. We need other people um, here to do so. To, the need to fight back and the um, inspiration that I gave to a lot of Muslim women, like loads of my friends who tend to be quite, like not quiet in a sense, but like not very political or keep away from it, felt very inspired by it, which was great to see. Um, but there was this one comment about me, immediately assuming that I was an Islamist. And like this, it shows the division of the left and like the immediate need to attack a Muslim woman, even though she's like attacking UKIP, who are the racists. Um, and it just shows, in terms of France Le Pen, that like when she speaks the language of the left, and like you see the left attacking a Muslim woman, not like attacking Le Pen and her racism and the actions and the words she speaks. I think it's um, that we should always go to wherever racist may be, individuals or group, turn up and make sure we shut it down and make sure that we speak the truth and say we do not stand for this and the general nation and people in this country will not stand for it. Um, so I guess... That <laughs> Um, our first speaker is Alex Lunacos, a leading member of the SWP and an author of many books, which are right there if anyone wants to buy it. Um, yeah, so do you want to go ahead? Thanks. Thanks. Well, I, it's a great honour, actually, to be speaking here alongside Naima and Wayman, real revolutionary fighters against racism, as we saw yesterday. <laughs> and that's really what I, what I want, want to talk about. What I want to talk about is how central to Marxism is the struggle against racism, the struggle for black liberation. Because particularly if you study at university, you will have been told that Marxism has a problem with racism, that Marxism can't address the question of racism, that Marxism is race blind, that somehow, because Marxism talks about class, it can't talk about and fight against race as, as well. And this is absolute, absolutely wrong. So let's go back to the very founder of the Marxist tradition, Karl Marx himself. This year is the 150th anniversary of the publication of his greatest work, the first volume of Capital. It was published, published in September 1867. So, and if you've, you know, if you've had a look at Capital, let alone read it, you'll know it's a thousand pages long, really detailed, big footnotes, and so on and so forth. So you'd think, God, this guy must have spent all his time when he was working on capital in the British Museum, studying far away from any real political life. But in fact, the opposite is, is true. The mid-1860s, when Marx wrote Capital, was the time in his life was he, when he was most effectively political, politically active, when he was a leader of the newly founded International Working Men's Association, the first international, the first real international so socialist, socialist movement. And what was one of the key questions that Marx identified um, in, as uh, a leader of the, the first international? It was solidarity with the North in the American Civil War. In other words, support for the war that ended up destroying the slave system in the, in the United States. And when, while Marx was writing Capital, 
part of what he was talking about in Capital was the way in which racism and the oppression and exploit, super exploitation of black people is built into the very development of capitalism. There's a, one of the best chapters in the book it has the very unpromising title of the genesis of the industrial capitalist, chapter 31. So you'd think this must be a real bore. In fact, it's brilliant because he shows how capitalism formed itself as a global system through colonial conquest, through colonial wars, through slavery, and that this connected set of things, colonialism and slavery, in particular the development of the slave plantation economy in the Caribbean and the, what became the southern U United States, was critical to how capitalism established itself as a system. So Marx was analysing the centrality of slavery to the development of capitalism as the same time as he was supporting the struggle to destroy slavery where it was strongest then in the, in, the, in, the, in the United States. And he's very clear. He says if Lincoln, the US president, wants to crush the South, then he has to arm the blacks. He has to create black regiments that f will fight in the Union Army and help to destroy the slave power. And if anyone knows anything about the American Civil War, they will know that the development of the black regiments was crucial because it helped to undermine the morale of the white racist South to find their former slaves coming for them armed, <laughs> coming for them as an army. So, uh, and it wasn't just then that Marx uh, addressed the question of racism. A few years later, he wrote a famous article, a famous letter to some friends of his in New York, because he was connected with the developing socialist movement in the, in the United States. And he said, in Britain, the dominant, f it, I'm summarizing, this isn't how he puts it, but he says in Britain, the dominant form of racism is anti-Irish racism. Irish migrant workers from what was then a colony of Britain did the heavy labour that built modern Britain, that built the, the railway lines, the aqueducts, the sewers, everything on which modern British capitalism f almost physically rests. And he says these Irish migrant workers are subject to systematic racism that's encouraged by the church, by the media, and so on and so forth. And he said, this divides the working class in Britain into two camps. And he says, this is the hidden secret of the impotence of the British working class. In other words, racism divides the working class and therefore prevents it from effectively fighting capital, from fighting the bosses, from fighti fighting the state. So Marx is identifying the role that racism plays, not just in the development of capitalism, but in the reproduction of capitalism, its continuation as a, as a system, um, back in the 18, 1860s, and, 1860s and 70s. And that understanding is our starting point. The way in which racism doesn't simply oppress those subject to racism, but divides the working class and weakens it, this is central to our approach to fighting racism. For us, fighting racism isn't just a moral issue. Of course it's a moral issue. Any, any decent person wants to stand up against racism. But for us, it isn't just a moral issue. It's a class question. If there is to be a united working class capable of overthrowing capitalism, then socialists ha have to be in the forefront of fight fighting against, against racism. So it's this, if you like, strategic understanding of the way in which racism doesn't simply cause immense suffering, but also weakens the working class as a revolutionary force. It's that strategic understanding that informs our approach to racism. So we say revolutionary Marxists, revolutionary socialists like us, have to be in the forefront of the struggle against racism. Now, I could talk, and you probably had heard about the great history of different, uh, of the role of revolutionaries in diff different struggles against racism. I want to focus on 
the history of the Socialist Workers' Party. Because if you look at the history of that party, you see how important the struggle against racism was. So in the, 19, no, the 1960s were the moment when immigration, migration, the presence of large numbers of migrant workers in Britain first became a real politi political issue. And when you had racist campaigns and governments of both the Tories and Labour capitulating to those racist campaigns and imposing immigration controls. And one, one of the things that Tony Cliff, the founder of what became the so Socialist Workers' Party, was most insistent on was that we had to oppose all immigration controls. If you were a revolutionary, you had to oppose all immigration controls. In those days, there was a lot of talk about how you could have democratic racist controls, progressive, sorry, Freudian slip, uh, democratic immigration controls, uh, non-racist immigration controls. Cliff took the line, any immigration control is racist, and if you're a principal socialist, you have to, um, you have to oppose it. And from time to time in a revolutionary organisation, it's necessary to uh, expel someone because there's some profound political, political disagreement. It doesn't happen very often, and it's unfortunate when it happens. Cliff used to boast that the first person to be expelled from our organisation was a man called Sid Bidwell, who was a long-standing Trotskyist activist who became a Labour MP. And as a Labour MP, he voted for a, a law restricting, restricting immigration. And then he had to be expelled from our group because you couldn't be a member of our group if you supported any kind of immig immigration controls. And for Cliff, that was symbolic of where we stood as, as, as revolutionaries. But of course, the key test is that, of, is that of practice. And I want to mention two examples that, form, that are part of my experience. First of all, uh, this is a year full of anniversaries. And in August... We were remembering the great demonstration in Lewisham um, in 1977, 10th of August 1977. It's a date that's burnt on my memory, when, which inflicted the most important defeat on the streets that the Nazi National Front, the then rising face of fascism in Britain, in Britain fa faced. And essentially what happened at Lewisham, I mean, you're going to, as there's the build-up to the anniversary, there'll be all sorts of discussion and coverage and so on. But what really happened at Lewisham was that you had an alliance between the black youth of South London, led by people like Darkus Howe, the black revolutionary who died just a few weeks ago, and uh, socialist activists, crucially, in the Socialist Workers' Party. I was at another anniversary meeting last night with people who were involved in solidarity with the struggle against the Greek dictatorship back in the, back in the late 1960s. And one of the speakers there was a guy called Steve Jeffries. And Steve has not been a member of the Socialist Workers' Party for a long time. But in August 1977, he was on the Central Committee of the Socialist Workers' Party. And he played a key role, along with other other comrades in the SWP, some of whom are still, uh, still around. I don't know if I can see any of them in the room. I can see one of their sons, um, for, ex <laughs> for example. Um, they played a critical role in organizing this alliance of black youth and revolutionary so socialist militants. And it was a marvelous day because you could see, you, you know, very often, you, of course, you know from demonstrations against the EDL and so on, you don't get near the fascists. This time, you saw the protesters. For some reason, I was a bit far away <laughs> when, when this happened. But I saw, in the middle distance, a great phalanx of anti-fascists breaking into the, the fascist march and breaking it up, breaking through the police lines. I saw young black men and women dressed up for Saturday night with platform shoes and things like that, but holding bricks <laughs> and bits of broken glass, you know, to deal a blow, a literal blow to the fascists on their way to, to whatever night out they were having that, that evening. So that was a moment 
Don't let anyone rewrite the record of what happened in, in Lewisham. It was the Socialist Workers' Party, not on its own, with others, people like Darkus Ho and the, the, the black youth of South London, played a critical role in, in defeating the fascists. And it was on the basis of that that we were able to build the Anti-Nazi League to initiate it, again, working with lots of other people on a very broad basis, people in the Communist Party, people in the Labour Party, to build a mass movement that drove the, the Nazis, that drove the National Front back into the, back into the gutters. I could tell, give lots of other examples, but I, I don't think I need really to say, to say any more to indicate that what these two and the other comrades did yesterday is a continuation of a long, long tradition that is the very substance of the, of the Socialist Workers' Party. One of the things that I've learned, being a member of the SWP for a very long time, is that the issue that motivates comrades most is fighting racism and fascism. Other issues, of course, are very important, opposing war, solidarity with different workers' struggles and so on. But the thing that gets people's juices going most and brings them onto the streets in, and to fight is, is the que question of racism, racism and fascism. So we stand in a very proud tradition and we're carrying on today that tradition. And it's very important that we do that because we are facing the most serious racist offensive um, of, of my lifetime. Um, and I have to qualify that. Britain in the 1960s and 70s was a much more endemically racist society uh, than Britain is today, in the sense that you had the open expression of racist attitudes all, all, all the time. The reason why Britain has become less endemically racist in that sense, in terms of everyday life, is critically because of the kind of struggles that, I, that, I've, been that I've been talking about. But that makes the fact that official co politics is moving so fast in a racist di direction worse, because we've actually won great advances. Through struggle, they weren't given, we won them. The danger is ev even greater. And, you know, it's fantastic to see Paul Nuttall humiliated, but in a way, a way he humiliates himself every day. You know, <laughs> simply when he opens his mouth, he humiliates himself. UKIP is on the back foot. That's great. And, you know, we should try and, you know, drive the stake into their hearts. But one r crucial reason why UKIP is in such tr trouble is because the Tories under Theresa May have stolen their clothes mm. and wrapping themselves in the Union Jack and Brexit and, 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 and so on. And that's the danger we face at the present, present time. Therefore, of course, it's crucial that we build stand up to racism as the broadest possible alliance. And it's also very important that when there are expressions of black self-activity, black people organizing to resist, whatever form it takes, we support it. That was true of the Black Panthers back in the 1960s and 1970s. You know, we had differences about strategy and so on. That didn't make that wasn't important. What was important was here were black people organizing against the racist Ameri American state. Their comrades here who were very involved in the emergence of Black Lives Matter here, here in Britain. That's part of our tradition. We support, champion, and participate uh, in black so self-activity. So we have to be involved in all those sorts of things, and we have to unite with anyone who is willing to fight racism at the present time. And therefore, what Stand Up to Racism has achieved so far is really good, but it's only a beginning. We need to build a much bigger and broader movement to face off the racists who confront us, not just in this country, but of course, you know, we only have to look across the channel to see what's happening with Le Pen, across the Atlantic with Trump, and so on and so forth. We need to have to build a very big and broad movement. But the understanding, 
What comes to us from Marx is an understanding that racism is built into capitalism. And therefore, you know, it's, we're not going to get rid of racism by having a nicer, nicer politicians or a better education system. Obviously, those, well, nicer politician may be a contradiction in terms, but, you know, as good, anti-racist, progressive uh, education system as possible, all that sort of thing is good. The only way that we can be safe from the threat of racism is to destroy capitalism. And that's why we're building a non-racial party of black and white revolutionary fighters, because there needs to be a fight against capitalism itself. Everyone in this room is part of that project, of building that party. Or if you're not, you should join us, because we need as many people as possible to carry out this task, not simply of holding off this racist offensive, but of getting rid of racism altogether. Because when you look at people like uh, Donald Trump, or you and you see what's happened. Actually, there's a shift. There's a polarisation taking place. See, somebody like Donald Trump could never have been president in terms of the... It tells you how there's a problem with the ruling class. Their key method at the moment, the fault line they use, is racism, Islamophobia. Actually, in some, and sometimes you use anti-Semitism against people. They use divide and rule if they think it's necessary. And I want to talk about the importance of what I describe as a Marxist and the revolutionary tradition. Because often when they talk... This year is the anniversary of the Russian Revolution. And you know what they never talk about? They never talk about what the revolution actually did. They never talk about, particularly when it comes to the question of racism, they bury it. Because when people talk about how do you change things, Russia, there's an excellent book there by um, Dave Sherry, and it actually goes through the question about Russia being a, a prisoner of nations, and also the level of racism. I, I, I claim to be reasonably well read, but I'm not, but there's a book called Dostoevsky. Have you ever read this book by Dostoevsky called Crime and Punishment? Read that book, because they tell you what's interesting about it. It's the level of anti-Semitism in Russia. The way he talks about Jewish people having passports in order to move from one place to the other. And it's just normal. And then when you read about the revolution, it's smashed all to pieces. The same people that accepted those ideas changed in struggle. And when you think about the question of Islam, 10% of the Russian population was Muslim. Yet the first Congress for Muslim rights was held in Russia in 1919. And the question there was 200 women uh, attended that as well. It tells you that in transformation, people change themselves. And that's part, of the Marxist, that's part of the Marxist tradition. There's something else that's important. Every time there's a struggle, every time somebody talks, you know, we talk about Darkest Howe. Do you know who Darkest Howe's uncle was? C.L.R. James. Well, every time you look at a struggle that takes place, often, of course it's spontaneous, but often in the kernel of it, there are people that understand who their enemy is and have a method about how to fight them. And these people are sitting in this room. We will not, of course, a spontaneous struggle will take place, but a spontaneous struggle against racism can be defeated by the way that they try and divide and rule over us, unless we have at the core of it, I think, a multiracial revolutionary party. And in part of that is what we're trying to build today. During the Russian Revolution, there was a man called Claude McKay. I don't know if people know who Claude McKay is. You know when um, there's, a, there's an old drunken imperialist by the name of Winston Churchill, right? <laughs> and he made this speech about we'll fight them on you. And he also said, he actually quoted, it's called McKay's um, poem. It was a black guy from the West Indies he quoted about how Britain's finest hour would come, right? That was Claude McKay. Claude McKay was the first representative of the American Communist Party. To, he went there by himself and he was welcomed to the 1919 conference to say about how to fight back. That means in the heart of our tradition, that's always been the case. And you should read what he says. Because he says he went to Russia in the Re Russian Revolution and he said he couldn't get to the conference because so many people, people surrounded him and picked him up on his shoulders and carried him in to the conference. Now I tell you, he came from the South in America and they weren't carrying people on the shoulders then if you were a black guy. That wasn't happening. So something had happened in America that people turned around and said that. But you know what's also important? When he went there, he wasn't an official delegate. And the reason he became an official delegate, because Lenin and Trotsky said, how come he's not an official delegate to the American Communist Party? He said, that's not good enough. Mm. It's got to change. We've got to be the tribune of the oppressed. That's the heart of our tradition. Mm. And that, the reason why I raise that is because people don't talk about it. It's buried. Mm. And we have to resurrect that because the heart of building a revolutionary party is the fight against oppression and division. And something else. I think when we go to fight, we also have to have a strategy and organisation to, to build. People say um, that 
I'm not, I think the French comrades have, uh, have, have been brilliant in terms of the way they've fought. They have been. But there's a reason why, in Britain, the, um, the fascists have been defeated. There's a reason why Tommy Robinson turned up on the demonstration this year on his own. Do you mean? It's because we've broken all, uh, we broke all the attempts for them to be able to use and divide that. At the heart of that is the question of why you need a multiracial revolutionary party. I've got a good, I call him a friend. I want Jeremy Corbyn to be the next prime minister inside this country, and I want Diane Abbott to be the next home secretary. But do you know something? My heart sank when they gave up on the question of freedom of movement. And if you want to understand why they gave up on the question of freedom of movement, it's because of the pressure, it's not good enough just that I believe they're committed anti-racist and there are people who are prepared to fight. But the pressure on people is to concede. We, you look at the question of Obama. Do you remember Obama was going to get rid of racism? Actually, when you go to the Black Lives Matter demonstration, you actually see racism's got worse. It's actually got worse in the sense that the people that run the society are the people that are, are, are proposed. I want to argue that the core of being able to change our society is the acts of the working class in terms of the way they change. I always tell this story. When I joined the SWP, to be honest, I wasn't a revolutionary. I was a black nationalist. And I remember during the... Um, uh, there's two things that actually tell you about worker struggle. It's, it's an old struggle question. But I remember the question when I was a kid, growing up in East London, there was, there was a miners' strike. And a man called Ted Heath, who was a prime minister, came out and said, that, um, who should run the country? And, um, he's, and then he said, the power belongs to the people. And as he said that, the lights went out. Right? And the reason why that's important, I said to him, it's not him that runs the country, and I was about seven years old. Because the real question is, is the power to change society rests with, with the rest, rest of the working class. The second thing that changed me was that during where I, where, when I was growing up, there was a riot that took place inside Tottenham. And it was about, um, there was a riot against, against racism, and a policeman was killed. And I went to a, a, um, a, a rally in Yorkshire, which was mainly white. And the miners got up and gave a standing ovation to um, a man. Called, um, they gave a standing ovation to somebody who was involved in the campaign, and said, "We support what you did." Now, in those days, that wasn't something which was common. In other words, people change and shape what they do by by being involved um, in, in the, by being involved in the struggle. And I think that what we're faced with now means that we have to build the biggest anti-racist movement, but we also have to build, in the kernel of that, a revolutionary party. I've never seen a situation where you've got Gert Velders inside, um, that we celebrate a fascist just missing coming to power inside, inside, um, in, in, inside Austria, who says that the Holocaust was, wasn't a key issue. I mean, to, the idea that somebody from the, you know, there's, that somebody can say the Holocaust didn't matter tells us what a serious position that we're in. But part of that is also having the confidence to say that we're the majority and we're not the minority. Even with Le Pen, 83% of people voted against Le Pen. The real question is who organises that majority? And the que that question requires, I think, the question of a revolutionary party. But also, all the time we're confronted by something, I remember the EDL called a, a, um, a pride march in East London to march on East London Mosque. And you see, the problem is, you're confronted. When you go to struggle, it would be great if one group of people lined up on one side and said, we're the racist, we're for whatever it is, we're for the ruling class, we're for Theresa May, and you line up on the other side and say, right, we're for being able to struggle, we're for unity. Actually, the biggest argument takes place where you are. The first time you go to struggle, there's an argument of people saying, well, who can we, who can we ally with? And then the, the question of revolution is make a difference. You see, in East London Mosque, we asked the trans... Uh, we, we asked a trans plus person to come and speak inside the mosque. By the way, they couldn't speak in the Catholic Church because they weren't ready to um, do that, put them on the pulpit. That meant that, and then when the demonstration, when they attempted to have the demonstration, there was a pride march which was led by people that were against the Nazis. That required people thinking that through. It matters that people could think through how to build an organisation. And, and at the end of the day, what happened was the pride march didn't take place, but you know what happened? The Nazis were destroyed because there was black and white unity Muslim, gay and straight, young and old, came together and actually were able to fight to change that. And that part of the reason why I'm saying that there has to be also a thinking part of being part of an organisation. The tradition, the understanding, because that's, that's what makes the difference. If you have an organisation like that, you can talk about changing the world. And to be honest, if you want to see UKIP cry, right, then... I can give, we can have that experience together, right? <laughs> but I think that it's good to see UKIP cry, but you know who I want to see cry? Donald Trump. Yeah. I want to see Donald Trump cry so badly, I want to see small hands trying to wipe away the tears <laughs> that come out from his, 
from, from, from his face, yeah? I want Theresa May to disappear out of history. The, I don't know if anybody's heard of a man called Wilhelm II. You, you shouldn't have heard of him anyway, because it's only if you do GCSE history. But he was a Kaiser of Germany, and he just disappears one day. <laughs> he's, suddenly, he's suddenly the Kaiser, and he disappears. It's true. He ends up somewhere in Holland, and no, one's, no one can find him. He's gone. Right? Before, it's a big question of where's Germany, and he disappears. Why did he disappear? He disappeared because of revolution. He disappeared because of change. And I think that part of getting rid of racism is to have that kind of change. And every struggle has done that. Um, Alex mentioned the civil rights, the civil war in America. That struggle involved black people coming out together in order to change. The struggle against apartheid was the people coming up, black and white people coming out to change. Every struggle has raised that question. But if we want to talk about getting rid of racism once and for all, it's, capitalism was born of racism and division imperialism. If we want to talk about getting rid of that, we have to talk about destroying the system that, that created that. And that part of that weapon is all of us have to have an idea of what part we're going to play in it. I want you to join the Socialist Workers' Party and whatever it is, but I'll tell you something, I think we're going to need thousands of people to do that. And I think one of the other things we're going to have to do is they have to be confident in order to be able to challenge that. When they said, who does she think she is? She's a member of the SWP. She's confident because she's part of a group that's part of the working class. She's confident because it's part of a tradition when we've come forward. And we need thousands of sisters like this in order to be able to change our world, and we're going to do it. So I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs>